that the seminar is recorded and will be posted on um, uh, on the, the central YouTube channel. Without any further announcements then, Claudia, we're looking forward to your seminar. Hey, thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to talk a little bit about our work on the atomic scale structure of complex semiconductors for thin film solar cells. And before we start, I would, uh, of course, like to acknowledge all the people involved in this. So obviously, this is my group at Leipzig University, the structure and properties of complex materials uh, group but also our collaboration partners. And for this talk today, this is mostly Susan Shaw and her group at the Helmholtz Center in Berlin and Silvana Botti and her group at Universität Jena. There we go. Okay, so why thin film solar cells? Now, a typical silicon solar cell has a thickness of around 200 micrometers. And this is represented by this a uh, yellow bar over here. Now, in comparison, a sheet of paper, oh, sun comes out, nice. A sheet of paper has around 80 micrometer thickness, so much thinner already. And a thin film solar cell typically has an absorber thickness of around two micrometers. And you can see that in the SEM uh, cross-section image here. So this is one micrometer and here we have, well, maybe one and a half uh, can be up to two or three micrometers, but that's usually it. So we're about a factor of 100 thinner than a typical si uh, silicon solar cell. And this obviously has some benefits, first of all, a reduced material consumption. And this leads to lower costs and a lower energy payback time because of the reduced material consumption, but also because the deposition of these polycrystalline thin films usually requires much less energy uh, than what you would need for a silicon solar cell. Furthermore, using these thin films, you can prepare flexible or curved solar cells. And this obviously opens up uh, new possibilities. So thin film solar cells are an alternative to silicon photovoltaics and they have a high technological potential. Now, there's a range of materials that are being used as absorber materials for such uh, thin film solar cells. And in this talk today, we want to look at two classes of materials, the so-called chalcopyrites and the castorites. The most prominent material for the chalcopyrite group is copper, indium, gallium, diselenide or disulfide, you can see that up here, which has reached a record efficiency of more than 23% on glass. And so this is really closing the gap to silicon-based technology also in terms of efficiency. But interestingly, uh, efficiencies of more than 20% have already been achieved on flexible polymer substrates. And as I already said, this offers interesting new applications. So you could uh, think of photovoltaic cloth in your clothes or, or bags, um, but also about another topic, which is building integrated photovoltaics. And to give you just one example, the image down here shows the Gross Peter Tower in Basel. And everything on the outside that is not a window is actually covered with these uh, thin film solar cells. Now, indium and gallium are considered uh, critical raw materials. So people are looking for alternative absorber materials. And that brings us to the other group of materials, the so-called castorites. And one example is this copper, zinc, tin, germanium, selenium, sulfide. The main benefit is that most of these elements are uh, non-toxic and they're earth abundant. The major drawback at the moment still is the record efficiency, which is only around 13%. So we would need, obviously need to improve this uh, significantly to make this uh, material technologically relevant, but it definitely is considered a promising alternative absorber material. And you may kind of guess now why I used to call this a complex semiconductor. So up here we have five elements, down here it's already six. And then on top of that, I mean, this is just a matrix elements, we have doping, we have impurities. So there are really a large number of chemical elements present in these materials. And this is also the reason why they are um, used so successfully in, in many fields of application because you can 
choose or the material properties depend on the alloy composition. And by choosing the composition, uh, you can do band gap engineering and material optimization. And I would like to show you this in a bit more detail for the case of this copper, zinc, tin, germanium alloy and the selenide. So if we look at the crystal structure and we start with just a tin compound, so copper, zinc, tin, selenide, it crystallizes in the castorite structure. Uh, we have three types of cations, copper, zinc, and tin. They all have four selenium neighbors. You can see that for the copper here. And the selenium has two copper neighbors, one zinc and one tin. Now, if we look into the periodic table, germanium and tin are in the same column. So they're chemically very similar. And indeed, if we use germanium instead of tin, we get the same crystal structure. Now, we can actually mix the two. And this is what we call a semiconductor alloy. So this lattice side, this one over here, is then populated randomly by tin and germanium at the same time. Now, if we look again at the periodic table, they're in the same column, but not in the same row. So that means they do not have the same size. Germanium obviously is smaller than tin. So if we look at the crystal structure um, or the lattice constants of the crystal structure, we have here the lattice constant A, this is the short one in that direction and this direction. And on the other side, we have the lattice constant C, this is the long one in this direction. And we plot this now as a function of the germanium content. So we have the germanium to tin plus germanium ratio. If this is zero, we have the pure tin compound. If it is one, we have the pure germanium compound. And we can see that the lattice constants for the tin compound are larger than for the germanium compound, as we would expect. But furthermore, in between, for the alloy, the lattice constants change linearly with this germanium content. And this is a very typical behavior for such semiconductor alloys, and it is known as Weygaard's law. Another important material property is the band gap energy. So if we look at the basic principle of a solar cell, what we do is that we use sunlight to pump electrons from the valence band up into the conduction band. And when they go back down, they create electricity. Now, the energy difference between these two bands, this is what we call the band gap uh, energy. And this determines first the fraction of the solar spectrum that we can absorb. So it determines the current of the solar cell, but it also determines the voltage of the solar cell. And so this band gap is really a crucial parameter for the efficiency of the solar cell. And if we look at it, so here we have the band gap, again, as a function of the germanium content in the alloy, we can see that the band gap goes from around one electron volt for the tin compound up to more than 1.5 electron volts for the germanium compound. And depending on what type of solar cell you want to do, there's usually a sweet spot for the band gap where you can achieve the highest efficiency. And by choosing the germanium content, we can choose a band gap within this range. So I hope this shows you that uh, the, the strong benefit of these semiconductor alloys is that we can tune the material properties for example, lattice constants or the band gap by choosing the material composition, by choosing the ratio of these two elements uh, that we mix. Now, as everything in life, uh, this comes with a price and the price is that we have different local atomic configurations. Because if we look at one particular group four atom, this can be only tin or germanium. There is no such thing as an average group three atom. So locally, we have different atomic configurations. And as I will show you in the talk today, they have uh, different structural parameters. And that is why we need to study the element specific structure of these semiconductor alloys. Now I want to, uh, or if, told you why we are interested in complex semiconductors being used for thin film solar cells. I will say just very few words about uh, the experimental side of our studies. And then I would like to show you the results for this castorite alloy, copper, zinc, tin, germanium, selenide. We will discuss bond length, the anion position and the band gap energy. 
Then I will highlight a few results from the chalcopyrite alloys, copper, indium, gallium, diselenite mostly, and then I'll finish with an outlook and a summary. So it's no surprise to you that we use um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy to study the element uh, specific local structure. And just to have everyone safely on board very briefly, uh, what is the important um, points for our work. So we measure the absorption coefficient as a function of energy. We have the absorption edge, then we have the fine structure, and we usually divide this into the Zanes region and the Exafs region. And in our work, what I want to show today, we focus on this Exafs region. And there, the basic idea is that we have the incoming X-ray photon, which is absorbed above the edge, creating a photoelectron. And we can imagine this photoelectron as an outgoing spherical wave. And that wave is then scattered at the neighboring atoms. And what we get is this interference pattern. And the interference at the absorbing atom, whether it's destructive or constructive, that affects uh, the absorption uh, probability. And it is obvious, I think, that the details of this interference pattern depend on the structural or geometrical arrangement of the neighboring atoms. And that is how we can extract uh, information about this local structural environment. In particular, we can determine coordination numbers, bond length, and we also get some indication of disorder. So if not all the atoms have the same distance from each other. And really the, the characteristic thing about exafs that we employ in our work is that it is element specific because we measure this fine structure for one particular absorption edge. And that means that we get these structural parameters for the environment surrounding a particular element in our sample. Is it okay with the sun? I mean, I can close the blinds if you prefer that. That's fine. Okay, then I'll just uh, keep going. So. We do the measurements uh, at the synchrotron and what I show you today has been measured at uh, beamline P65 at Petra 3 at DAISY in Germany and at the LISA beamline at the ESRF in France. We usually measure both powders and thin films. So the powders we dilute uh, with graphite and then we press them into uh, small pellets. And the thin films are grown on glass exactly in the same way as if you wanted to prepare a solar cell, uh, and then we measure them uh, as grown. Uh, depending on that, the measurements are performed in either transmission or fluorescence mode for the powders or the thin films. We usually measure the cation edges. So in this particular case, going from around 9 keV for copper up to around 29 keV for tin. And we usually do the measurements at low temperature. For us, that is 10 to 20 Kelvin. And the reason is that we want to minimize the thermal motion of the atoms. That increases uh, the signal, um, so the data quality, uh, but it also simplifies the analysis and therefore leads to a higher precision uh, for the structural parameters that we've determined. Okay, that is what I wanted to say uh, for the experimental side of things, are there any questions? Well, uh, if anyone has a question, please type it into the chat while I ask mine. Um, you suggested that the present 13% quantum efficiency for this formulation of solar cell was inadequate. And I was surprised at such a strong statement. So you've gotten rid of the toxicity with cadmium in the other formulation, and you have considerable advantages with respect to silicon in terms of applications that silicon simply can't do, uh, such as painting the side of a building and why not, and whatnot. So is it clear that you actually, I mean, how much do you think you have to improve that 13% before there's uh, niches where uh, this can start being in the world? Okay, I think this is a, a quite a quite extensive question because so maybe <laughs> first I want to to say that um, usually uh, the benchmark uh, still is silicon and as long as you cannot really compete with silicon or at least get into the range uh, of, uh, of the silicon performance people say ah, it's not worthwhile industry will not uh, will not buy it um, I think this all depends a little bit uh, on the on the conditions. So, for example, if 
we cannot get indium and gallium anymore. If this should ever happen, then I think a material that has a lower efficiency but is available will become interesting. Another thing is that uh, the, the price, the production price depends on so many things. It depends on alternatives uh, as long as we have gas and oil and it is um, uh, cheap, then we have to compete with that. If we run out of gas and oil, any alternative will suddenly be, uh, be attractive, right? So it depends on a lot of uh, other factors as well. That's why I also like to talk about this energy payback time that I mentioned, which is the time that you need to operate the solar cell to gain the energy that you had to put in to produce the solar cell. This is an intrinsic physical property and it is independent of uh, market uh, issues such as uh, the supply and demand and other things. Uh, and even there, the thin film solar cells beat the silicon uh, by a long way. Um, however, they have not yet um, establish themselves in a similar uh, market share as silicon, but maybe this is just a, a question of time. And there are many competing materials out there. There are the uh, hybrid perovskites, you may have heard about them, there's big um, hype at the moment. Uh, there are organic materials, there are other um, inorganic materials. So I think it is good that we look into many different types of materials because in the end, we want to have more than one option. And which one in the end wins industrially on a, on a business scale is difficult to, uh, to predict. So that's why I think efficiencies are something that, yeah, you can keep an eye on it. But independently of that, I think it is important that we study these materials, that we understand them uh, so that in the end, we have a few options that we hopefully uh, can uh, use to, to uh, supply our energy requirements for the future. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, there was a quick follow-up question. Do you happen to recall um, the rough quantum efficiency for the polymeric uh, uh, solar cells? I can't remember if it's below 10 or above 10. What do you mean with a polymeric uh, on, on a polymer substrate or the, uh, no, 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 the, 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 the organic? The, the organics, I'm sorry, the organics photovoltaics, I'm sorry. I think that depends a lot on what material you're looking at. Um, I do not have um, the, the record efficiency of the best okay. organic solar cell at the top of my head, sorry. What I no do problem. know is that at least in the past, uh, they suffered from long-term stability. And this is also the main issue with this hybrid perovskites, apart from containing toxic elements like lead, um, they're not yet long-term stable. So you get superior efficiencies for a few hours <laughs> and then it goes down. This is not what you want to have on your rooftop, right? Uh, you want something that's stable over 10 or even better 20 years. Yeah, so if... I think this will also be um, a trade-off. And also just coming back to the, the, the question of efficiency, I mean, obviously, if you have a similar material with similar benefits, which performs better, then it will be hard uh, to beat. Uh, but on the other hand, I think it depends a lot on production costs. I mean, we do have much space available in, in cities, for example, rooftops, buildings and all that stuff. And as soon as it gets uh, cheap enough to produce these solar cells and you have large areas that you can cover, I think you can also live with a slightly lower efficiency as long as you can produce the material easily and cheaply and the, the um, resources for that are available. So efficiency is one parameter that people look at, but I think it is important to look at it in a certain context and not just as the one number. I think this yeah. is uh, thinking too short. Okay, very good. Thank you. We'll let you continue. Okay, so let us look at uh, the results for this particular castorite alloy, copper, zinc, tin, germanium, selenide in, in detail now. So everything starts for us with the bond length. So here we have again uh, this castorite crystal structure I've already shown you. Uh, all the cations have four selenium neighbors. That's also the reason why we measure the cation edges because then the nearest neighbor shell consists of just one uh, element. Uh, simplifies the analysis. And we measured all the cut iron edges, and then we can extract from the excess data the bond length. And you see them over here, plotted uh, again as a function of the germanium content. So for the pure tin compound, 
uh, and bear with me, this is now abbreviated. So it's copper, zinc, tin, selenide. Uh, we have the copper selenium, the zinc selenium, and the tin selenium bond length. Now, if we go to the pure germanium compound, same crystal structure, we have almost the same copper and uh, zinc bond length, but as expected, the germanium selenium bond length is much smaller than the tin selenium bond length. And this correlates with uh, the smaller uh, lattice constants. Now, if we look at the alloy, we have, as I said, we have the same crystal structure, uh, but this lattice side of the group four uh, elements is now populated randomly by tin and germanium atoms, depending on their uh, on the fraction. And we remember that the lattice constant changed linearly with composition, which is known as Weygaard's law. So based from that, we would expect that also the element-specific bond length change linearly with composition. And for copper and zinc, this is exactly what, uh, what we observe, but not for tin and germanium. So here we see completely different bond length for tin selenium and germanium selenium. And this is despite the fact that these two elements share the same lattice side. So the element specific bond length are different than the distance between the lattice sides. And this may sound like a contradiction at first, but it is not because the crystal structure is the average periodic long range structure, and it does not distinguish between tin and germanium. It averages over that. Whereas if we look with exas, we look element specific locally at either the tin or germ germanium bond length, and they turn out to be different. So if we take a weighted average of these values, then we get exactly this linear change that we would expect based on the crystal structure. But if we do look locally, we have different bond length. And this behavior is very typical for basically all tetrahedrally uh, coordinated semiconductors. And the reason is that it actually takes a lot of energy to stretch or compress a bond. And it takes much less energy to bend the bond. So the lattice mismatch between the parent compounds is accommodated in the alloy mostly by bond angle relaxation and only to a very small extent by bond length uh, relaxation. And this can be understood in terms of the energy required for the respective uh, distortion. So if we look at these different bonds, um, how much, so I said they, they change only very little. They do change a little bit, we can see that. And how much they change, how much they respond to a change of the lattice, that depends on how stiff or soft that bond is. And that can be described by the bond stretching force constants. And interestingly, we can use exafs to measure these bond stretching force constants. And in order to do that, we have to look at the fact that what we actually probe is an interatomic distance distribution. And what we call the bond length is the average value of that. But we also have a width, a distribution. Where does it come from? Well, it can come from, also it's described by the standard deviation sigma, or we will use sigma square, which uh, you may know as the x of Steve Waller factor. So where, where does it come from? Well, it can originate from structural uh, disorders. So if you have defects or strain in the material, but it definitely originates from thermal disorder. So the atoms vibrate relative to each other due to thermal motion. And the X-ray absorption process is very fast. So it's basically like taking a snapshot and we catch some atoms closer together and some atoms further apart. And this is why we get a distance distribution and not just a single uh, value. So if we analyze this sigma squared, the measure for the width of the distribution. This is plotted here for the copper selenium bond in copper zinc germanium selenide. And we analyze this as a function of temperature. We can see that it goes up with increasing temperature. And this can be easily understood because as we increase the temperature, the atoms start to vibrate more strongly and therefore the disorder, the width of the distance distribution increases and how much more strongly they vibrate for a certain temperature increase, that depends on how stiff or soft the bond is. 
And this can be described by a so-called correlated Einstein model. So we have the sigma square as a function of the temperature. And the key parameter here is this K that I've marked in red, and this is the bond stretching force constant. So we can fit the data and this solid line is actually a fit with this model. So it fits very nicely and we can extract the bond stretching force constant. And this is what we get for the uh, tin compound and for the germanium compound, for the copper selenium bond, the zinc selenium bond and the tin and germanium selenium bonds. And what we see is that copper selenium has the lowest force constant, so it's the softest bond in the material. Then we have zinc and the highest force constants um, are observed for the tin and the germanium bonds. So these bonds are the stiffest bonds in the material. And that correlates very nicely with the ionicity of the bond. And this is a well-known correlation that the more ionic a bond, the softer it is, and the more covalent the bond, the stiffer it is. So this is also what we observe here. So based on that, if the lattice changes due to alloying, we would expect the copper selenium and the zinc selenium bonds to respond more, to change more than the tin or the germanium bonds because they are much stiffer. So let us look again at the bond length. We see that they do change a little bit. And maybe I can convince you that actually the germanium and the tin bond length have the largest slope, slightly larger than for copper and zinc. So isn't that in contradiction to what we just said about the force constants? It seems to be. But again, if you look closely, it turns out it is not. Because what we now have to consider is these different local configurations. So the selenium has to copper one zinc and one group four neighbor, and this can be either germanium or tin. So we have these two different local configurations for the selenium. And using the measured uh, bond length, we have modeled the bond length of the individual uh, configurations. This is what we get for the tin configuration, the open triangles. So we have the tin bond length up here, but then we have zinc down here and copper down here. And you can now see that these individual bonds decrease more strongly for copper and zinc than for tin. And we get a similar picture for the germanium configuration. These are the open circles now. So we have germanium down here. And then we have again zinc and copper. And again, the copper and the zinc bonds now change more strongly than the germanium. And what we actually measure with exiles also is a weighted average. It's element specific, but it is still a weighted average over all the elements in the material. And therefore we average over these different configurations. So the important points here are that we have different bond length for the different configurations. And when we look at the individual bonds, the copper and the zinc bonds change more than the tin and the germanium bonds as we would expect from the force constant. So everything is fine, but we have to consider these local configurations. Now, if you look at them and if we say that we have different bond length in the two configurations, but the cations are more or less in the same position because that is what the lattice um, determines, then the selenium position must be in a different place for the two configurations. And this is what we looked at next. So we have the two configurations and now we look at the relative position of the selenium anion in this tetrahedron down here. And we project that on the xy plane. This is shown in the bottom uh, graph. And we project it on the xz plane. So basically on the plane of your screen. And this is shown in the top uh, graph. And for the germanium configuration, we get these relative selenium positions. And for the tin configuration, we get those. So very clearly we have different anion positions in the different local configurations. And this means again that in this material we do not have a single anion position as the friction tells us. The friction sees the average, but if we look at one particular selenium, it can have different positions depending on whether the neighboring group 4 atom is germanium or 
tin. What we also see is that even for a given configuration, there's a slight shift in the anion position as we change uh, the germanium content. Uh, and this uh, is interesting. Um, you may say, well, this is just a small shift, who cares? I mean, in the end, why do we care so much about all this anyway? We care so much because it affects the band gap energy. And we can see that from up initial theoretical calculations shown here. So the band gap was calculated for different X, Y, and Z positions of the selenium anion for the tin and the germanium uh, material. And we can see that in all cases, the band gap changes uh, dramatically if we change the anion position. So using this and using the small shift of the anion position um, that I've shown you on the previous slide, we can estimate that this small shift corresponds to the change of the band gap by roughly 150 milli electron volts. And this may not sound so much to you, but it is significant for a solar cell and the efficiency of a solar cell. Now we can go even one step further and look again at the band gap as a function of composition. And you may have noted that when I showed this to you uh, in the beginning, here we have the band gap as a function of composition. And in this case, the dependence is not a linear dependence. So here we have the linear dependence. This is the actual dependence. And if we take the difference, this is called the band gap bowing. And this is plotted in the lower graph as a function of germanium content. The orange area represents the values reported in the literature. And if we now take the selenium position that we've modeled for the two different configurations uh, and we calculate its impact on the band gap energy due to that little shift and we do a weighted average, then we end up with this red curve which shows the contribution of the anion position or the changing anion position to the band gap bowing. So I hope this shows you that the selenium position strongly affects the band gap energy, the absolute value, but also its nonlinear dependence on the composition. And therefore, if we want to understand the material, if we want to model it precisely, if we want to really know how composition correlates with structure, correlates with material properties, it is not sufficient to look just at the crystal structure. We also need to look at the element-specific local structure of the different configurations, and we have to take that uh, into account. Okay, questions at this point of the talk? Yeah, there's a few. Um, uh, Matthew, would you like to ask your question first? Okay. I was wondering about uh, whether you uh, looked at the higher neighbors, uh, higher than first nearest neighbor. So as, uh, that might give more information about the local like, uh, off-site uh, distortion of the atom positions. So for instance, the fourth neighbor is in the FCC structure. Yeah, it has a, a well-known multiple scattering uh, focusing effect uh, due, to, uh, due to intervening atom. And uh, that would be very sensitive to, uh, to local distortions. We did, so the short answer is no. We only analyzed the first nearest neighbor and the reason becomes obvious when you look at the crystal structure. So if we take this uh, copper, for example, uh, it has just selenium nearest neighbor, but already yeah, this, more complicated. the second neighbor shell consists of zinc, copper, and uh, germanium and tin. And in addition to that, uh, the lattice constant A is typically not exactly half of C. So we also have an effect of different bond length, whether you go in that direction or in the upwards direction. And what happens is that due to the overlap of these different scattering paths, just single scattering path from the second nearest neighbors, even at low temperature, there's basically almost no signal left. They cancel each other out um, due to interference. So it is very different from, for example, zinc blender alloys, where you can very nicely analyze second nearest neighbor and third nearest exactly. neighbors. In this material, it simply doesn't work because even at low temperature, you have just a few, you have a tiny hump left, and then you have to fit already four or five 
single right. scattering path to that. And I yeah, mean, you can do I, it, but uh, what you get is not, um, the uncertainties are very large. Right, the uh, fourth neighbor has uh, fewer uh, different atoms and perhaps a simpler geometry, but it does have the multiple scattering, which makes it more complicated. Yes, yes. But is it at least observable? Hardly. Okay. <laughs> Hardly. So, so usually you see idea. a very nice first nearest neighbor peak, and then you have something where, yeah, it, it just dies down very quickly. So it's very different from um, other crystal structures where you have less elements and more symmetry of the cubic, it gets a bit simpler and so on. Okay, uh, not seeing any other questions. Okay. I have a question for the, the very end, but you okay. should please continue. All right, will do. Uh, so to show you that this is not uh, just some, um, yeah, weird feature of this particular material system, I would like to show you very br briefly um, just two results uh, for this other material system that we studied quite a bit in the past, the trichopyrites. So let us look at the copper indium gallium uh, diselenide. This is the crystal structure. It's the trichopyrite uh, type crystal structure, but it looks very similar. Uh, again, we have cut ions that have four selenium neighbors. And the selenium now has, again, two copper neighbors, but then two group three neighbors. And they can be now indium and gallium. So here we have an alloying of indium and gallium on the same lattice side. And if we look at the bond length, then we get a very similar picture um, as for the castorite material. So the gallium selenium bond length and the indium selenium bond length are very different from each other. They're almost constant, very different from each other, uh, although they share the same lattice side. So this is what I meant with that this behavior is observed in almost all tetrahedrally um, bonded semiconductors. Again, we have different local configurations. In this case, uh, there are three because the selenium has two um, copper neighbors and then two group three neighbors, the orange ones over here. And they can only be two gallium, one gallium and one indium or two indium. So we have three uh, configurations. And if you look down here again at the difference in bond length for indium and uh, gallium, then obviously the selenium in this configuration cannot be in the same position as the one in this configuration. So again, we have a displacement in this direction here, depending on the configuration that we look at. And we call this, uh, this the, the, no, sorry, the displacement between copper and group three atoms. Now, we also have a displacement in the mixed configuration in the plane perpendicular to your screen, because we have here a gallium, we have here indium, and one bond length is larger than the other, and that will displace uh, the atom in the screen uh, perpendicular, in the plane perpendicular to the screen, and we call this the displacement with respect to indium and gallium. And now we've proceeded in a similar way, we looked at what impact does this displacement have on the band gap? And we estimated the contribution to the band gap bowing. So this material also shows a band gap bowing. You can see the uh, experimental range given in gray. We have the, sorry, I forgot to mention that. So now obviously we have the indium content uh, on the x-axis, indium to indium plus gallium. And for the displacement between copper and group three, we get Ah, it's there, but it's a very small contribution. And this is really interesting because such a displacement has a huge impact on the band gap energy. But the average displacement in that direction is almost linear with composition. And therefore, it almost does not contribute to the band gap bowing. In contrast, for the displacement between indium and gallium, we get a significant contribution. And that is despite the fact that the impact on the band gap of such a displacement is an order of magnitude smaller than this one, but the average displacement is highly nonlinear as a function of composition because this displacement only occurs in the mixed configuration. And therefore, we get a significant contribution from this displacement mechanism to the band gap bowing. So again, we observe that the element-specific local structure is different from the average crystal structure, 
and it does affect the material properties, for example, the band gap bowing. And the correlation is not trivial. Um, you have to take into account uh, different factors uh, and it is not a priori clear uh, what impact you have from a certain local configuration unless you look at it and you measure the structural parameters and you estimate uh, the impact. Now, the, uh, the second thing that I want to show you is about uh, copper indium gallium 3 selenium 5 and copper indium gallium 5 selenium 8. They're called the copper poor phases and they're important uh, during the growth of this material uh, for uh, thin film solar cells. They have a similar crystal structure, in particular a tetrahedrally coordinated crystal structure. But as you can see, we now have fewer cations than we have anions. And that means that these materials feature 20 to 25 percent of cut iron vacancies. So many of the cut iron sites are actually not uh, occupied. And the other letter sites typically show a mixed occupation. So in addition to that local configuration that we already had in the chalcopyrite structure, we now have this configuration with one copper, two group three and a vacancy. Or we can have a vacancy and three group three atoms. And now you can think of how many configurations you can build up if you choose indium or gallium for uh, either of these. So it is not surprising that if we look at the disorder at the sigma square, the X of D by Waller factor again, now as a function of copper to indium plus gallium, we have the uh, stoichiometric chalcopyrite over here. And then as we go down with the copper content, the disorder goes up. So particularly for indium and gallium. And this is simply due to the fact that we have an increasing number of different local uh, configurations. Now it becomes really interesting when we look at the bond length. And what is plotted here is not the bond length itself, but the difference of the bond length compared to the bond length of the stoichiometric chalcopyrite. And as long as we stay in this chalcopyrite phase, the bond length does not change. But when we go to the copper poor uh, phases, the bond length increases, especially for uh, the copper bond. Now, this is really remarkable if you look at the lattice constant, because the lattice constant decreases. So this means that this large number of vacancies results in a contraction of the lattice. So there we, we take out so many cations that the lattice shrinks. So based on that, you would expect that the bond length also decrease. But the opposite is the case, because even uh, though the lattice shrinks, locally the atoms still have more space because there are all these vacancies and the selenium also tends to be under coordinated in these configurations. So the bond length relax a bit and actually expand. So this is another very nice example where the local structure is different from the crystallographic structure. And we have to consider that if we want to understand the details of our material. Okay, with this, I would like uh, to come to an outlook and I want to just uh, highlight three short points. So please uh, follow me on that. Um, we've also looked at other materials recently. Uh, one thing is that we came back to the chalcopyrites and this time we look at copper silver alloying. So for a group three element of gallium or indium, we look at the substitution of copper by silver. And we also look again at the gallium indium alloying, but now with silver instead of uh, copper. Another material that we've looked at uh, recently is indium sulfide doped with different transition metals such as vanadium. Here the question is whether the vanadium goes to octahedrally or tetrahedrally coordinated letter sides. And the material uh, was, was studied um, with the aim of, of looking for intermediate band materials. They're called intermediate band materials and both uh, material classes are again interesting for uh, applications in thin film solar cells. And the very last, uh, we've started to work with copper iodide and copper oxide based alloys. So for example, copper bromide iodide or amorphous uh, copper tin oxide. 
and these materials are used uh, or um, people want to use them for transparent electronic uh, devices. And again, the question is, what is the element specific local structure? Is it different from the crystal structure? How different and how does this impact the material properties? So this was on the materials uh, that we look at. Uh, the other two points are more on the instrumental uh, side of things. So as I said, we did all our measurements so far at the synchrotron, like most people uh, did. Uh, but we do now have a laboratory spectrometer. We call it LEXAS, the Leipzig X-ray Absorption Spectrometer. It's an easy XAFS uh, 300 plus. It operates with a standard X-ray tube and it is based on this Roland circle geometry. So we have the X-ray tube, we have a spherically bent crystal analyzer, and then depending on the angle via the Bragg condition, we select X-rays of a certain energy, they hit the sample, and then we can measure in transmission uh, the intensity. And by moving the components along the circle, we can change the angle and therefore vary uh, the energy of the X-rays, and we can measure the absorption as a function of X-ray energy, very similar to what we do at the synchrotron. This is it, looking inside uh, the machine from the top. So here we have the X-ray tube. Here's the crystal analyzer. Over here is the sample. And then this is the detector. In between, we have a helium chamber to reduce uh, the absorption uh, through the air. And the little piece that we are most proud of at the moment is this thing here. And this is a 40 Kelvin cryostage that was uh, developed most recently by EZXAFS, where the samples sit on a cold finger. Then we have the vacuum chamber. You can see that over here. And then we can go down to something like 40 Kelvin. And we have already measured our first XAF spectra at 40 Kelvin in the lab. We are very excited about that. And now uh, our aim at the moment is a systematic evaluation of the EXAF's uncertainty. So in particular of the bond length and not just for a copper foil, for example, but for real scientific samples. So we already measured a few of those castorite samples where we have the comparison from the synchrotron data. And the question is what uncertainty in the bond length can we achieve with the laboratory-based uh, measurement so that in the future we can decide for a certain project, do we do this in the lab or do we still need to go to the synchrotron? Last but not least, we've also uh, been uh, active in instrumentation at the synchrotron uh, where we have built a ZEOL setup at Beamline P65 at Petra 3. So uh, ZEOL is short for X-ray excited optical luminescence. Uh, we come in with the X-ray beam, we excite the core level electron into the conduction band, and at some point it will relax down to the valence band. And in doing so, it can emit optical luminescence. And this is what we call uh, ZEOL. And you can use it to study defects and luminescent centers in a large variety of materials. We are again interested in deep defects in absorber materials for solar cells. So this is what the setup looks like. We have a rather large uh, cryostat. Uh, the beam comes from the left. If the sample permits, it goes uh, through to the right. So we can measure in principle in transmission. Of course, we can measure the X-ray fluorescence. So this is the exit port over here. So during the measurement, there would be an XRF detector in front of that. And we have an additional optical window over here uh, where we can uh, access the optical luminescence. And this is done by this optical head over here. The signal is then transferred to a state-of-the-art optical spectrometer. And using that, we can detect the uh, optical luminescence in the ultraviolet to visible and near-infrared regions. And thanks to the uh, optical spectrometer, we can do that with a very high spectral resolution. So that is the main um, strength of this setup uh, and this is uh, needed if you want to study defects uh, in detail. So using this we can do simultaneous zeol x-ray absorption fine structure uh, measurements. We get 2D maps as the one shown down here for gallium nitride. We have the x-ray energy 
uh, vertical and then the uh, wavelength of the optical luminescence on the horizontal. So if we make a horizontal cut for a fixed X-ray energy, we get the luminescence spectrum as you would also get uh, if you do uh, photoluminescence with a laser, for example. And if we choose the wavelength of a certain defect, for example, and we make a vertical cut, then we can look at this defect intensity as a function of the X-ray energy, and we can compare that with the X-ray absorption um, data. So this is a very nice combination of two techniques. And as I said, it can be used to study defects and luminescence centers. Okay, that's it. Uh, I would like to briefly summarize my talk. Uh, I have told you why we are interested in complex semiconductors, why they are used as absorber materials in thin film solar cells, and how we can use X-ray absorption spectroscopy to study the element-specific local structural parameters of these materials. And the main thing to, to take with you is that the atomic scale structure in such semiconductor alloys differs from the crystallographic structure. We have different atomic configurations, different local configurations with different structural parameters, element specific, and this affects the material properties. The example that I've shown you was the band gap bowing, which is affected by the different anion positions in the different local configurations. And that is important if we want to understand the material, if we want to really know the correlation between composition, structure, and properties in order to be able to tune and optimize the material for a given application in a device. Thank you very much. So wonderful talk. Uh, following the German tradition, I'm knocking on my desk. Um, <laughs> We have uh, we have several questions. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Leah, would you like to ask your question first? Hi, yeah, thank you, Claudia. Um, this is a really great talk. Uh, I was wondering, so you're finding all of these different local configurations. Um, have you found that you can tune them and how does that affect the device performance? To tune the different local configurations, that I guess is tricky. So, I mean, what you can tune is the composition. So the ratio of the two elements that you mix on a given letter side, for example, this you can tune. Um, maybe depending on the growth condition and the material, you could tune uh, whether you get a random distribution of these elements or a certain ordered configuration. If you would have an ordered configuration, then you would uh, basically get a different crystal structure with reduced uh, symmetry. So I know not so much for this uh, chalcopyrites and kesterites, but for the three, five semiconductors, indium, gallium, phosphide, for example, depending on how you grow them on the substrate, you can get ordering of indium and gallium. Uh, for the chalcopyrites and the kesterites, this had, I'm not aware of this. Um, maybe this would be possible, but I think then this is the end. Everything else the material makes because one particular atom can only be tin or germanium. And if it is, then you get certain structural parameters depending on the letter size, which is again given by the, by the composition and on these uh, force constants. And they are also intrinsic, so I would not know how to, how to tune that. So you can tune the composition, you can maybe tune the ordering, you can tune the morphology of, uh, so on the, on the micrometer scale, but you cannot tune these intrinsic uh, local configurations in terms of their structural parameters. And I think this is still, um, this is why it is important to look at them because you have to take them as they are. So you should at least know what you're buying. Okay, very Thank good. You. Peter, thank you. Thanks, Leah. Uh, Peter, you have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, Claudia, thank you for a very nice, uh, very clear uh, presentation. Um, you talked about the about 20 to 25 percent defects in this uh, charcoal pyrite. Uh, so I was just wondering um, what kind of defect is it and what is the origin of this defect? You know, how is it introduced? Can you, um, just like the last question, can you uh, 
tune these defects. And, okay, uh, let, let me see if I can uh, go I think this was slide 17. Yeah, but... yeah, I was just wondering if there's a a really smart way to go back faster than going one uh, one by one, um, but maybe this is actually the fastest. Okay, um, so where where do they come from? Um, so basically, um, there is some debate about the the exact crystal structure of these materials, whether it is chalcopyrite or stannite or something else. But all these uh, crystal structures that have been discussed, they are tetrahedrally coordinated. So in that sense. They are similar to this. So every cut iron, looking just at the lattice, every cut iron side has four unironed sides neighboring, and every unironed side has four cut iron sides neighboring. And then the difference between chalcopyrite and stannite and others is just um, just okay. Just <laughs> it is how you populate uh, the cut ions on the different letter sides with which order um, that makes the difference. But there's tetrahedral coordination. This is what I want to say. And if you have a crystal structure with such a tetrahedral coordination, you have the same number of cut ion sides and union sides. Okay. Now, if you look at these copper poor faces, in this case we have four cut ions versus five unions. In this case, we have five cut ions versus eight unions. So we have the same number of lattice sides for cut ions and unions, but we do not have enough cut ions to actually populate all the cut ion sides. And that's why we have a large number of cut ion sides that are vacant. So these are really cut ion vacancies, empty, empty lattice sides. And it comes from the stoichiometry and the crystal structure. Mm. Uh, okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, maybe a follow-up question. So you'll be using the XEO to uh, be able to look at this, uh, to quantify the defects. Um, so um, yeah, right now, is this couple, is it ba this 20 to 25% based on calculations or based from the X-ray data or just something that is measured or something that it, it okay. can be estimated so this... based on the structure? This is not related to the outlook on the on the ZO. So we have started to look at the, the stoichiometric CIGS uh, samples, so the, the copper indium gallium disilinite samples, or slightly off stoichiometric, but not at the copper poor faces. Um, this, um, this number of 20 to 25 percent cut iron vacancies simply comes from uh, the stoichiometry of the material. So People have looked at diffraction, X-ray diffraction and neutron diffraction. They're sure about this tetrahedrally coordinated crystal structure and they have measured the composition. So this is nothing that we did. This is uh, known from the literature. They've looked at the composition of the material and they get this ratio of cut ions to unions. And from that, you get how many cut ion sites must be vacant. And this is where this number of 20 to 25 percent comes from. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, maybe one last one is for the outlook. Yeah. So the uh, measurement of the determination of the, uh, the vacancy, or the defects, um, would, could that also be applicable to light elements? So in this case, you have heavy elements, so with XF is fine. Um, uh, but when we talk about light elements, uh, like lithium, for example, sodium, okay. Uh, would that be applicable to, to this kind of material? That's the materials of my interest. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have to make an important distinction here when we say defect. We use the same word, but we actually mean two different types of defects. So in this case, on this slide, we talk about structural defects, a vacancy or an, an atom on the wrong letter side, something like this. This is a structural defect. For the, for the zeol, uh, what we look at is electronic defects. So let me go to that slide. Okay, so if you have, so down here we have the valence band, here we have the conduction band. So now we're looking at the electronic structure of the material. And what we now call a defect would be an electronic energy level inside the band gap. And this is what you can study with the zeol, because if you have a band here, then the electron maybe does not relax down to the valence band, but into the defect band, or it is already in the defect band and it relaxes down to the valence band. And then because the energy difference is different, you get a different wavelength for the optical luminescence. So you can use this technique to study electronic defects. 
Now, the electronic defects usually stem from structural defects. But the correlation, to, so to know which structural defect creates what sort of electronic defect, that is often the tricky question. And that's actually one of the questions that we hope we can address uh, with uh, such measurements. Uh, but this was, uh, so the, the setup was finalized last year. So we did a, a few first measurements, but we're still uh, figuring out uh, the data and all the little things that you suddenly have when you do a new technique and you have new effects. Uh, so um, there's nothing yet that I can show you in terms, uh, in terms of results, but the setup is available. It's available to the user community. Uh, and the idea is to, because you can combine it with XAFs, the idea is that you can maybe hopefully correlate information about the electronic defects with information about the structural defects to make exactly that connection, how they, um, which belongs to which basically. All right, we'll move on to one very last question. Uh, Masood, uh, perhaps a brief question and answer. Uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Um, I was just wondering what your perspective is on using pump probe exhaust, for instance, exciting your material for with a laser and then see what's happening in very fast time scales. Uh, for that, you need a time resolved uh, detector for the, you, you're talking about the ZL? Uh, yeah, and, and this yeah. Uh, in, in particular, for instance. Yes. Using for that, for, electron lasers, for, instance. for that, you need a time resolved uh, detector. So, this is not what our setup can do. I know that there very recently has been another ZO setup implemented at the ESRF uh, at ID16B with a strict camera, and they do exactly that. They look at the time dependence of the optical luminescence signal. This was not the aim of our setup. The aim of our setup was to have the maximum spectral resolution for the optical luminescence. And there we had to compromise. And we went for the spectral resolution and the setup at the ESRF, they went for the time resolution. And then you can start to do measurements like this, but you need a different detector. You need a different uh, setup. Thank you. All right, as we're out of time for the seminar proper, let's please uh, thank Professor Schnorr again, and perhaps uh, those who'd like to can hang around informally for some more questions. So thank you, it was wonderful. I'll stop the thank recording. You.